Good evening and welcome to the third of four forums with candidates for office for the November 3rd elections that is brought to you by Cuyahoga Community College and The Citizen. I'm your moderator, Guy Cosentino. On November 3rd, voters across the nation will go to the polls to vote for president and members of the House of Representatives. Really, those elections seem to be taking the oxygen out of everything, but there are other races in New York, especially for the New York State Legislature. All 63 members of the Senate are up and 150 members of the Assembly. And we've brought you some of those forums already, and we'll do another one on Tuesday, uh, the 27th. Keogh County has three uh, Senate seats. One is the 54th, and that has incumbent uh, Senator Pamela Helming. Uh, she was here last week to do, or two weeks ago, to do an interview. And then we held on Tuesday the forum for the 51st Senate District that is open for the first time in more than 30 years with the retirement of Senator James Seward, who's not seeking re-election. And that was with James Barber and Peter Oderberg Barker, excuse me. Uh, tonight we bring you the forum for the 50th Senate District. That has uh, been a seat that has been vacant since literally January with the resignation of first term Senator Robert Antonacci who became a New York State Supreme Court uh, judge after serving only one year in the Senate. A special election was called by the governor and then it was canceled because of COVID-19, as many special elections were. The 50th district is a district that includes about half of the city of Auburn and half of the northern half of Keogh County and much of Onondaga County outside of the city of Syracuse. This year we are delighted to have both candidates who are running uh, for uh, in this race. Uh, we have uh, Angie uh, Renna, who is on the working family, excuse me, the Republican, Conservative, and uh, Independence Party lines, and John Mannion, who is returning to the studio. He ran against Mr. Antonacci two years ago. He is on the Democratic and Working Families line. With COVID-19 and the worldwide pandemic, we have had to change the way we do forums. You might notice if this is the first time you're tuning into one because this race is important to you. Jeremy Boyer is still asking the questions. He's the executive editor of The Citizen whose weekly column appears on the editorial page of The Citizen, but he is not in the studio. He is remote. You will be hearing his voice and seeing his picture on the screen. We've also no limited the number of individuals in the studio to our camera person, the two candidates, and myself. Usually we have a student who is a timekeeper. I will play that role today. Our candidates who are sitting in the order of their opening statements are, as I said, Angie Renna, who is on the Republican, Conservative, and Independence Party line, and John Mannion, who is on the Democratic and Working Families uh, line. We appreciate them appearing today. I'm told this is their only their second televised debate. So welcome to the studio. Uh, we're gonna, we flipped a coin beforehand how we're going to go back and forth. Uh, Ms. Renna, you have two minutes. You're on the uh, Republican, Conservative, and Independent lines. You have two minutes for your opening statement. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you to Cayuga Community College. Thank you to The Citizen, to Guy, Jeremy, John for joining me, and, and all of you that have made it possible to be here with you. It is an honor uh, to be able to have this time to, to share ideas. Uh, I am a mother of twin boys that are 23. I am a small business owner, and uh, I'm a, a community supporter. So I have been in the uh, district uh, for over 25 years. And I moved here raised my family here, fell in love with the area, and am proud to be a part of Central New York. My small business is in financial management, which I have done for over 25 years, and my clients are just like you and I. They're, they are nurses and teachers and police officers and factory workers, and uh, I am proud to support them and help them throughout their retirement planning to help them find solutions so that they can have an affordable and comfortable place to live here in central New York. And that is the reason why I've decided to run. That is the reason why I have been involved in making sure that we keep New York State accountable. And so it was uh, for me not a, not a time to sit back and complain about things, but a time to get involved and to make things happen, which is why I've been working very diligently since I got into the race to make the plans to move Central New York forward, to move the 50th District forward, and I've got plans to do so, and I'm looking forward to sharing those ideas today with all of you. So with that, uh, John, thank you for, for having uh, this time with me to, to share our ideas, and I look forward to it. Thank you. We'll now hear from John Mannion, who's on the Democratic and Working Families uh, lines. Welcome back to the studio. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for having me on, Guy, and uh, thank you to CCC and the Auburn Citizen for hosting, and thank you, Angie, for joining. 
Um, I appreciate the opportunity. I was born in central New York. I was born on Tipperary Hill in the city of Syracuse, and my parents were blue collar workers. Uh, my grandparents came here to make a better life for themselves, and they did. The opportunities that this country and this region affords us are tremendous. And I want to make sure, as a native central New Yorker, that we continue that in the right direction. Um, I've been a teacher for over 27 years, an advanced placement biology and chemistry teacher. And in this time, in the midst of a global pandemic, and in a time where we're worried about our waterways, we need someone with the scientific background who understands the science of things at the cellular and molecular level to be able to make sure that we have legislation that works for us and we're proactive when it comes to some of our concerns in our environment. I also come with an education background, which means I get to see the problems that our society has right at the grassroots. I promise to be a strong advocate for the children of this region. I promise to make sure that we have a robust economy in the region and that we make sure that no matter what zip code you live in, you have every opportunity to be successful and live out the American dream. I appreciate having the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Thank you. We'll now turn to Mr. Boyer. He can ask a question of both of you or individually. If it's individually, you'll have two minutes and your opponent will have a minute to respond. If it's to both of you, you get two minutes each and we've talked about one minute responses. Uh, Mr. Boyer will start his first question. If it's for both of you, it'll start with Mr. Mannion. Mr. Boyer, welcome to the studio. Yes, thank you, Guy, for, for letting me dial in here today. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mannion and, and Ms. Renna for coming over to, to Auburn to answer some questions for our, our residents over here in Cayuga County. Um, I'd like to start by asking you both um, about a question that, that sort of has to do with the situation in this district. Um, the, the 50th has been without a representative since the start of this year, and while some neighboring senators have tried to help residents um, when they've needed assistance, they certainly can't replace the services that come when you have a senator and a fully staffed office. Um, with, with that in mind, um, you know, if you're fortunate enough to win this a race, what's your plan to deal with what might be a potential backlog in constituent service requests when you take office? Thank you for the question, Jeremy. I appreciate it. So it, it is a reality here that we have been living in a district without a state senator. And we're living in a district without a state senator during a global pandemic, during record rates of unemployment, and additionally in a pending and already started economic crisis. So the fact that we have been without a senator is very impactful. Therefore, when I'm elected, I will be in the Senate majority. There are grants that are sitting on desks in Albany that have not been passed through. I've spoken with community representatives and elected officials about some of the problems that have occurred because we lacked a state senator. One of those concerns occurs in the city of Auburn, and that is the funding for the arterial. Additionally, we have seen AIM funding be stagnant. That is going to affect our ability to fund our fire departments, our police, and our schools. We need to recover from this crisis. We need someone in the Senate majority, in the Democratic Senate majority, that is gonna make sure that we have legislation that works for us, that our voices and our values are heard, and that when budgetary decisions are being made in that conference, there's someone there to advocate. How do we support our constituents? I'm going to do that by hiring the very best staff. I promise to hire a diverse staff, both geographically, racially, and by gender. Thank you, uh, Mr. Manuel. Mr. Manuel, the issue of backlog in constituent services. You have two minutes. Thank you very much for the question. And I have to, there's so much to unpack there. So let me start by saying, uh, with regard to not having a senator sitting in the 50th district seat, uh, when the pandemic hit, we got uh, right to work. And I have received many, many calls from constituents, even though I'm not the uh, seated senator, 
with regard to helping them get their unemployment pushed through and helping them understand what their guidance is as a small business owner to reopen their businesses with regard to um, making sure that they were able to uh, approach the child care crisis, that they were getting connected with our, our partners within the child care um, uh, industry. And, um, you know, I have to say that if it was all about being in the majority, we have a senator in the neighboring district that's in the Democratic majority, and she did not or and could not do anything to help us. It has nothing to do with majority or minority. It has to do with willingness and the ideas to bring to the table to make sure that it gets done. And I have those ideas. I have the plans and I will put those in motion. And they are the plans that are best for Central New York so that we can start the recovery process and get our people back to work, create jobs, get our kids back in school, and make sure that we deal with the pandemic while we're doing that. And I look forward to, to bringing those solutions to the table. But uh, I do not believe that uh, being in the majority is the answer. And to the point that my opponent makes with regard to the grants that are not getting paid out, uh, they're not getting paid out because the abdication of uh, duty was made by the legislature to pass everything over to the governor. And the governor has made the decision not to pass those out. Through the, um, through the Department of Budget, he uh, passed a memo to do that. So not even the majority Democrats can push through those grants. It has nothing to do with who's got power in the legislature. All right, thank you. Mr. Mannion, I see you wanted to follow up with a minute. The grants that my opponent is referring to, I had meaningful conversations with elected leaders of villages and towns. These are Republican elected leaders who clearly stated that in 2019, there were grants, Empire State Development grants, for maintenance, for infrastructure, that were not passed through because there was no state senator. In moving forward, budgetary decisions are going to be made in the majority, as they have. It's the reality of the New York State Legislature. And therefore, the only thing slightly better than an empty chair in the Senate for the 50th Senate District is one in the Senate minority. You'll have one minute as well. Thank you, and I will say that I've had those same conversations as well. And if, we've ha if we had uh, senators that were in the majority that cared, they would have pushed through those, um, those grants if they had the power to do so, which they did not do. All right, thank you. We'll turn to Mr. Boyer. All right, um, well, you're, you're, you're both running to replace a man who um, was in the office for only a year, but his predecessor was there for 25 years, and that's certainly a long established history in this district um my question and actually i'm going to break every debate rule here and ask you like a four-part question um, but hopefully it's not too uh not too hard to, to follow but my question kind of based Thank on you, Mr. The, Boyer. the long history of mr de francisco is um first of all how long do you see yourself doing this if you're if you're able to win this election how long do you see yourself how many terms do you see yourself trying to win um do you support term limits as a spin-off of that question why or why not um, and if per, per chance you do support um, term limits, what do you think they ought to be? So, Ms. Renna, you have two minutes to do the eight-part question. Yes, okay. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll unpack that, Jeremy, and thank you. Um, and, and it really, the answer it boils down to what the term limits are, and I do support term limits. Um, we desperately need them across government. And so I would support uh, having a, a wonderful, robust discussion as to what the proper term limits should be. Um, I would really love to see um, this position turn from a two-year to a four-year only because of the, the wastefulness of having to uh, run a campaign, get into work, and then run a campaign again. And it do I don't believe that it does the taxpayers any service when you've got politicians focused on a campaign as opposed to getting the work done. So I would really advocate for a, um, a four-year term. And then whether the, the, the amount of terms could be two years or three years, you know, that's up for discussion. But we certainly need um, to make sure that we don't have someone in there for 25 years, 30 years. We need fresh ideas. We need fresh blood uh, in government. That's how we uh, make things um, uh, more relevant to, to what the needs are of, of the area. So, um, you know, I, I'm running because I see what the needs are and I know that I can um, work to fix 
what's broken in New York State as we're a race to the bottom. And so however long that takes, but I'm hoping it, I can do it sooner rather than later. Thank you. Mr. Mannion, on this issue of term limits, the multi-part question. Yeah, so I've been a, a teacher for 28 years, a biology and chemistry teacher teaching at the college level, and I love what I do. And I'm not really sure ready to leave my profession because I love it so much. But along with that, I have not been corrupted by the political system. And I come at this with a fresh view of it. I love what I do, as I said. I am compelled to run for this because I have a level of frustration with how government occurs and some of our elected officials. I have great respect for Senator DeFrancisco. He was a powerful senator and a well-liked senator, and that's because I believe he led with honesty. And when you ask Senator DeFrancisco a question, and I have, he would always give you an honest answer. And in central New York, that's what works. That's why he was so well respected. I don't I'm not concerned with how long I'm going to serve. I'm worried about the 2021-2022 legislative session. That is what we have to worry about because we are against a lot of challenges here and a major crisis that we're trying to get through. As far as term limits go, I have a five-point ethics plan, and one of those points includes term limits. I believe that the maximum time that someone should serve is debatable, but it should not be longer than 14 years. People should be able to get in office and do some good and not make it into a career. And that is what I hope for. It's part of my plan and it's what I will stick to. All right. Anything to follow up? Or no? Okay, Mr. Boyer. Um, kind of spinning off of that, um, I, I want to know where each of you stands on um, outside income limits for elected state legislators. That was um, that hasn't been an issue necessarily in the past year, probably because of the, the pandemic. We haven't heard as much discussion about Albany dysfunction and, cor and corruption lately. Um, but nonetheless, it's still an issue that a lot of um, government groups have pointed to as something that potentially um, uh, negatively affects. Um, the legislative process when people are are making a lot of money from outside jobs that could end up influencing their decisions as state legislators. So where do you stand on that? I know there's a pay commission that attempted to put it in when legislature got raises a couple of years ago, but court challenges have blocked that from happening so far. So do you support or do you not support an outside income limit? Okay. Mr. Mannion, you're up first on this issue. Part of that ethics plan includes a ban on outside income. Um, in 2018, my opponent uh, defeated me by 1.9%. He was a, a long-term um, county elected official. And he almost immediately took a position at a law firm after that election. I have pledged, and I will stick to that pledge, that although I love the career that I have, once I'm elected, the only people I'm going to serve are the constituents of the 50th Senate District. So I'll leave a profession that I love. In our last debate, my opponent had mentioned that she was going to get elected, go to Albany, and then go back to work. And I take that as my opponent not being supportive of a ban on outside income. Of Ms. course Hannah? I'm not. Of course I'm not, because we wouldn't attract qualified and quality candidates if you're just looking at people who aren't successful in life that uh, need a, a political job as a way to earn a living. You need to be able to attract good quality candidates that actually have real life experience and know how to solve the problems for the area in which they serve. I serve the people of Central New York. My clients are Central New Yorkers. That is why I understand what the issues are when people come to me and they say, I want to retire, but New York State is too, uh, too high taxed and I can't stay here and I have to solve their problems. That is what is driving me to want to step in and help fix the dire, dire straits of New York State. And if you ban outside income, you're not going to be able to attract quality people. You're going to attract people who are not successful in life, and they're going to use the taxpayer's wallet in order to earn an income. 
Mr. Manning, you'll have one minute on this. Historically, that is inaccurate. Corruption has been rampant in New York State government and in others. And as a result, legislation is necessary to hold these people accountable. That has nothing to do with banning income. That has everything to do with having people who, ups, who uphold ethical behavior. And I'm all for upholding ethical behavior. But I am not um, one to believe that banning outside income is going to drive uh, quality candidates to the table to help solve our problems. And if you want to further that, then put a pledge out there saying that you would during, if you were to uh, be elected, that at no time during your um, election and, and your service to the Central New Yorkers would you take your pension. And also you can, while we're at it, you can make a pledge to end your negative attack ads that are so egregious that that in and of itself should be ethical behavior. In fact, all the money that's being spent, the hundreds of thousands of dollars of money that's being spent to, uh, to send out negative mail pieces on me are, is dollars that could be spent for your own members to protect them with PPE and the things that they need to keep safe so that our kids can go back to school. Make those pledges to Central New York. I will let you all uh, leave it to Mr. Boyer to ask questions if you want to respond in your, your time allotted after Mr. Boyer asks you uh, his next question. You're more than uh, happy to do so. I think we saw that occur in the last two, uh, the last presidential and last vice presidential debate, but we'll keep it uh, a, a little bit more online. Mr. Boyer. Um, so you, you want, uh, I'm fine with them each taking one more minute to okay. continue that. I mean, it's up to you. All you right, I'm fine with that. Mr. <laughs> Manning, you'll have one minute. And Go ahead. Ms. Reno will have another minute as well. I've already pledged that um, as I'm running for this seat that I will fully be committed to the constituents of the 50th Senate District only. And in regards to um, what Ms. Renna had mentioned, um, some of the materials that people receive are simply pointing out her positions on issues. Ms. Renner, you have one minute if you'd like no, to. No, they're, they're, they're false ads. I've never, I've never made a position that I support women getting paid less than men. I've never supported that. That's ridiculous. Mr. Boyer. I'm going to turn to Mr. Boyer. Okay. <laughs> Again, you, uh, you can chime in at a, a different day, but I want to move on to mm -hmm. other issues as well. Mr. Boyer. Um, it, let, let's shift to the state uh, finances and specifically the state's budget gap. Um, the last number I believe that we've heard is that it, it's projecting about $13 billion right now um, of a state budget gap. Um, certainly COVID is a big part of it, but there was plenty of um, imbalance before COVID. Um, so I wanted to ask you, I guess, the, 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 the broad question of what's your position on how to best close that budget gap. Ms. you're up first. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for the question. So yeah, before uh, the pandemic, we were at a $6.2 billion budget deficit. Uh, now, uh, through the pandemic, it's $14.5 billion and, and climbing, and, and it's unfortunate. And uh, I know there's a call out, a cry out for federal funds. We desperately need them. It's unfortunately, it, unfortunate that it's come to that. Um, but in the, in the near term, we have to do what adults do, which is tighten your belt and make hard decisions so that we can uh, continue to support the services that are most important to continue for Central New York and, um, and doing so, um, tighten, tighten the belt on the budget. Um, I will say that uh, I don't believe in raising taxes as part of that during a, during a pandemic when people are still struggling, people are without jobs, people are still trying to um, pay their bills and catch up on things that they've uh, lost out on. So raising taxes is a crush to all um, New Yorkers, but certainly um, will be to, to the middle class. Um, but, you know, I will point to uh, Medicaid as one of those areas where the um, comptroller did a fantastic job and continues to do a fantastic job uh, with, with oversight with Medicaid. And in the last few audits that he has done, has uh, uh, recovered or uncovered, I should say, over $1.6 billion of improper payments. Um, through Medicaid and so that tells me that we need greater oversight of payments and how they're being spent 
and uh, you know no one wants to to cut services no one wants to to make any cuts but we do need to make sure that we're going line by line and 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 identifying areas that makes sense to spend and identifying areas where we're not getting a good return on our investment for the taxpayer. Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Romani, you'll have uh, two minutes on the issue of the 13.5, 14.5 budget gap. Thank you. Um, so I do agree that right now we're going through a time where we certainly have to look at both sides of this budget and that could mean looking at places where there are duplication of services or waste. That's absolutely necessary. We have a major uh, budget gap to fill. Um, we are going to need additional revenue streams for sure. I will say this, that of the citizens of the 50th district, the middle class people, the hardworking people, the people that pay income taxes and property taxes, the students that are in classrooms, our healthcare facilities, those institutions and those people, we are not gonna balance the budget on the backs of those. Therefore, we do have to look at additional revenue sources. Mobile sports betting is one of those. But additionally, I think we have to look to the 1% of the 1% that have benefited greatly from this state, the systems that exist in the state, and the human capital that works for those individuals. We're not talking about anybody that lives in the 50th Senate District having their taxes raised. But if you look at the tax codes over the course of the past two generations, they ultra wealthy have benefited tremendously. We're not asking to bring them back to the numbers of the late 70s and early 80s. All we're looking at is a minor adjustment to help the citizens of this state, the hardworking people that live and breathe in our region, a little bit of help, just to give a little bit more to help us get through this crisis. And I don't think that that's unreasonable. In 1973, the average CEO made 37 times more than the average worker, and people were outraged. That number is now over 400 times more than the average worker. And throughout this pandemic, the wealthy have done very well, while other people are sitting in lines for food. Ms. Renner? You have one minute. You know, it may sound good, but it doesn't look good on paper. It doesn't bring in anywhere near what you would need to close the budget. And in fact, it does hurt the middle class because those ultra rich own businesses and those businesses create jobs and those people are mobile. And if you increase their taxes, they're going to look to another state to go to to do their business. And they're going to take those jobs with them. And that means that our middle class neighbors in central New York lose jobs. So it does hurt the middle class. It will not work to close the gap. The way that you close the gap long term is by focusing on economic development and making New York State a better business climate and a better tax state to encourage more businesses to come here and then uh, create jobs. And that's what's going to get our economy going, and that will create the uh, revenue we need in different types of taxes, not income taxes, where uh, we'll drive people, uh, continue to drive them, mass exodus out of the state. Okay. Mr. Uh, Boyer, my assumption is you have another budget follow-up question. Uh, sure, I do. Um, you know, one of the areas um, among many, but probably one of the more prominent areas that's gotten attention for potential cuts in state spending is um, aid to schools. And um, some districts, or, or I should say across the board, the state, um, the governor's office has indicated there could be up, up to a 20% cut in state aid um, if federal assistance doesn't come through. Um, and with Washington being what it is, that's a very, um, you know, <laughs> tenuous circumstance to count on that. Um, so my question to both of you is, um, do you believe it's reasonable to have school aid cuts of up to 20% on the table as a potential option for cutting or for balancing the budget? Ms. Uh, Renna, I th excuse me, Mr. Mannion, you're first on this one. We absolutely cannot balance the budget on the backs of children. I've had great conversations and advocated along with educators in Cayuga County from the Auburn uh, Enlarged City School District 
And we sat in the offices of Assemblyman Finch. We sat in the offices of Senator DeFrancisco. And we fought against a flawed funding formula that has hurt the city of Auburn year after year after year. Programs have been cut. Class sizes keep going higher. Fewer services are offered. We can't do this on the backs of our children. The federal government needs to provide the funding that's necessary. And we have been bypassed. And I'm afraid part of that is because of the political climate that we exist in. So I have promised to always be a strong advocate for the children of the 50th Senate District. A friend of mine said this to me one time, and he heard it from, from uh, he, he took it out of a quote from a quote book, which was, the downfall of a civilization is obvious when it fails to fund the education of their youth. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Uh, Mr. Runner, the issue of school funding in New York State, you have two minutes on that. It's an unfortunate situation that we're faced with 20% budget cuts, something that is really the, the blame could uh, befall in the Democrats in the majority because they provided the governor with all of the authority to make those cuts and they have not gone back to work to repeal that type of power and so now we have an issue where we're, see we're seeing the potential for cuts in areas that we just cannot afford. Uh, that's why in my education plan, I've always been a supporter of continuing funding for education. In my education plan, you'll see that we will support uh, additional funding for PPE, for infrastructure needs, for buildings, especially in the city schools where the buildings are old and they need to be um, updated with better ventilation, better windows, better, um, just a better climate for kids to learn. Uh, we need to fund tech packs and Chromebooks. We need to make sure that we have all the resources these kids need to be successful in the instance that they can't get back to school, but with the priority that we do get them back to school. Okay. Mr. Manning, you'll have one minute. That education funding is critical. Senator DeFrancisco has been mentioned throughout this debate. He was a powerful man. He was in the majority. And that's why our schools were funded to the extent that they were. When the 2021-2022 legislative session starts, I will be in the majority. And I'll make sure that every dollar that is deserved of the children of this district comes back. Ms. Renner, you'll have a minute. The fact of the matter is our schools received more funding under GOP majority than they did under the Democrat majority. So Central New York does better when the Republicans are in the majority. Central New York does better when we have a Republican senator in the seat for the 50th district. Mr. Manning, you'll get a minute. I'm not sure where that number is coming from. Hey, Ms. Renner, if you'll... Well, ready. look at the budget numbers and, and, and what's been passed over the years, and you'll see. All right. I'm going to take a quick break right now just to tell everyone where we are and what we're doing here. Uh, you are listening to the candidates for the 50th Senate District. This is a forum, uh, the third in a series of four, that is hosted by uh, Q Community College and uh, The Citizen. Asking questions is Jeremy Boyer, uh, the executive editor of The Citizen. I'm the moderator, Guy Cosentino. We have in the studio today Angie Renna, who is on the Republican, Conservative, and Independence lines, and John Mannion, who is on the Democratic and Working Families lines. We're about halfway through, and we just wanted to let people know if they are just turning in what we're talking about. Mr. Boyer. All right, um, one more uh, semi-education related, or I guess it is an education related question. And, and I just wanted to ask um, Mr. Mann, you specifically, um, if you could talk about how you will handle um, dealing with issues that might, that might uh, be issues that the, the teachers union is advocating for to the state legislature. You being currently a teacher, and, and I know you also have experience um, as a leader for the, uh, for the union in your district. Um, you know, what do you say to voters who might view this as a potential conflict? So I've lived in the 50th Senate District my entire life. I um, grew up on Tipperary Hill, and uh, my wife, Jennifer, who is from the east side of Syracuse, um, we've built a life together in the town of Geddes. We have three wonderful children. Uh, two of them are at Lemoyne and one at West Hill. I have seen firsthand the amazing things that can happen in public education. 
and enriched education. In fact, my oldest son was diagnosed with autism at age three and a half. If he did not have the supports and the expertise within that school district, he would not be where he is today. My son is a senior at Lemoyne College, majoring in business analytics. He works as a camp counselor, an overnight camp counselor at Lourdes Camp. And additionally, he's a manager for the basketball team. That is what makes me and my wife a strong advocate for public education. And I won't apologize for that. My son had a litany of atypical behaviors that without intensive intervention that came from the public education system wouldn't have been diffused. And as a result, he is a huge success. And I promise to first be an advocate for the citizens of the 50th Senate District. But I will never apologize for being an advocate of the miracles that can occur in a classroom. Thank you. And in out of fairness, uh, Ms. Runner, you have one minute if you have anything you wish to add to Mr. Boyer's question. I think there are wonderful things that happen every day in the public school system, and I, I support and celebrate all of the wonderful teachers of Central New York who do a fantastic job. They uh, stepped up when we uh, were faced with the pandemic to, to new challenges that they weren't prepared for. And I think that all that we can do um, as legislators is give them all the resources that they need to be successful, to help our youth be successful. And that's why my, my education plan is focused on just that. All right. Mr. Boyer. All right, well, let's take a, a turn over to water quality issues. Um, as as you, you both, I, I imagine, know by now, having campaigned over here, um, uh, the Owasco Lake watershed is, is a very important issue to, to residents here. Um, and later this month, the town of Owasco and the city of Auburn are holding a joint meeting to vote on new rules and regulations for the watershed aimed at helping to reduce nutrient loading and, and dealing with other issues that have come along with that. Uh, that impact the quality of the water that's, that's used uh, by more than half the residents of this county as drinking water. Um, my, my question for both of you at this point is, do you support those changes? Would, um, and, and that's important because you, we would need you to advocate for them if, if they are approved by the, lead, by the, by the town and the city, uh, because ultimately it will be a state Department of Health decision whether to push them through. Uh, Ms. Renna, you have two minutes on this issue of water quality. Yeah, sure. So I've had the uh, privilege of being at some of the watershed meetings and learning um, about the issue uh, through the campaign uh, specifically. And um, obviously, we, we want to support our clean water. It's, it's such an important um, uh, component to our area. And I think that when we look at um, what those changes are going to be, that we have all the stakeholders at the table, that we are talking to uh, the neighbors and to the farmers and to the businesses um, and, and, and all of the uh, stakeholders that are going to make that decision. One thing that um, you know, I want to make sure that we do is not only maintain that good quality of water, but we, we help our farmers do what they need to do so that they can um, do their part but that we're not crushing them in the process and, um, and uh, making sure that, uh, that from an economic impact standpoint that we, we've taken all of these considerations um, in, in order to, to push forward. I know that the DEC has uh, some, some pretty robust mitigation plans in place uh, that, are, that are going well, and we're gonna advocate and support for clean water. I don't think anybody would say no to that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mannion, you'll have uh, two minutes on this as well. Yes, well, I um, appreciate the fact that I was welcomed uh, into this county and had great conversations um, with Aula and then also uh, uh, the Skinny Atlas Lake Association. And I came to the uh, open forums when they discussed the plans moving forward to try to make sure that we had harmful algal blooms under control. Uh, I applaud the City of Auburn for taking proactive steps and making sure that they have a carbon filtration plant that is keeping the water safe for the people of this area. But in those meetings, it was clear there was a high level of frustration because many of these people are volunteers and they needed help. They needed state intervention. 
and uh, I hope to be a strong advocate to make sure that happens. As I mentioned before, I understand this is issue. I understand the uh, size of the watershed of Skinny Atlas Lake and how much different it is than the massive watershed that is Owasco Lake. Um, that's just one factor. Additionally, the number of inspectors we have for septic tanks uh, in this county, Cayuga County, is, is subpar. We have to do better. Clean water that's drinkable is essential to our success. If we don't have it, everything else falls aside. In my county, many areas are served by Skinny Atlas Lake. In a pipeline that was built a very long time ago with no pumps, about 40% of the water that leaves Skinny Atlas Lake each day and enters Onondaga County is lost, never makes it into businesses, never makes it into residences. And that's why as we get through this crisis, we shouldn't just be throwing money at certain organizations and benefiting the ultra wealthy. We should be investing in our infrastructure. Thank you. Mr. Boyer. All right, um, sort of a spin off to that question um, is the, you know, in dealing with one of the issues for the lake um, and for all, you know, for all lakes in, in upstate New York has been um, the proliferation, proliferation of harmful algal blooms. And, and one factor that scientists um, tend to agree on is that uh, the, the warming waters are, are a factor in why we're seeing so many more of those these days. Um, and so addressing climate change um, is sort of a, a, a factor in dealing with water quality. Um, New York State is in the midst of, uh, you know, the legislature approved and the governor is implementing a, a, an aggressive um, push to reduce uh, fossil fuel use in the state. They're trying to get um, an 85 percent cut in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and net zero emissions from the grid by 2040. Um, 70 percent of source, sources from renewable energy by 2030. Um, we're seeing a lot of solar farms being produced or being proposed now in Cuga County as part of that uh, push. So where do you stand on that push in your state to, to aggressively reduce greenhouse gases um, and push renewable energy? Mr. Mannion, you have two minutes on this. Thank you for the question. So um, I teach this every year. I've taught it for 28 years. I teach about the eutrophication of lakes and the impact of nitrogen, phosphorus, organisms, temperature, and other variables that contribute to the blooming of harmful algal blooms. Therefore, um, I believe I am perfectly suited to the environmental crisis that we're living in. I do applaud the state legislature because they are taking aggressive action to make sure that we quickly transfer away from fossil fuel use. We have to partner with our local businesses and industry like Newcore Steel, and I've had great conversations with them. They're good partners uh, with our community, making sure that our environment is safe. However, they have to run a business, so we have to keep them in the conversation for sure. Outside of the environmental impact that is occurring from taking fossil fuels that took millions of years to metamorphosize and over the past 150 years pumped them out of the ground and burned them, that is affecting our environment. Beyond that, it's just the markets of fossil fuels. We must perform this transition because within 25 years, because of the production and use of fossil fuels in India and China, unlike they've ever had before, there's just simply not going to be a cost-effective, massive fossil fuel source like we've seen over the last 50 or 70 years. And therefore, it's in the best interest of our economy and the best interest of our environment and our children and our grandchildren to make this transition while keeping our partners of industry close. Thank you, Mr. Mannion. Uh, the issue of climate change and 
New York State policy. Sure, thank you. And thank you, John. You're well on your way to a career with the DEC. Um, what I would say to you about this is that we have to be very cautious about what we do. Um, we all want to have um, you know, a, a better, greener environment. We want to make sure that we're protecting uh, Mother Earth and, and leaving a great legacy for our kids. We also need to make sure that we are not creating an unlevel playing field for New York State and, and its businesses. So I would like to see some action and some movement more on the federal side as opposed to state side where we create, create all of this legislation that we're not ready for to implement and now all of our businesses can't compete and businesses are moving out of state because of it. So we do need to address it. There are big concerns. Um, the action plan would probably be to work with our federal partners and get something done on the federal level that all states have to participate in instead of New York being, you know, trying to be a pioneer here and losing more businesses because of it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mann, you'll have one minute to follow up. We have to be a pioneer. The federal government has let us down. They have rolled back many protections, including inspections of methane lines. And as a result, our problem of climate change is being exacerbated. So when we lack clean water, when the harmful algal blooms come back to Owasco and Skinny Atlas, property values drop, tourism stops, industry leaves. We have to keep our water clean. And New York State, has been a leader in this because they have to be. Okay. Ms. Reiner, you'll have well, one minute as well. Well, it's not going to be a change that happens overnight. And so, you, you know, legislation um, is, is not going to reduce the uh, warmer temperatures and, and help the algal blooms overnight. We need to work with our federal partners for a plan and, and, and impact that plan. And that's the best way to go about it to protect all, all of our stakeholders. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Boyer. Um, I want to make sure we get to talk a little bit about um, the, the New York State COVID-19 response. Um, I, uh, I think, Ms. Renna, you, you've alluded to the uh, emergency powers that the governor retained at, at this point. Um, um, they, they were given to him in March when we were just dealing, seeing the, the COVID-19 emerge as a threat. And um, the idea was we needed to be able to make quick decisions related to that on a statewide basis. Now that we're um, six plus months into it, is it time to rescind that power from the governor? And uh, that's for both okay. candidates. And you have two minutes to expand on your earlier comments. So, so there's two decisions that were, were made with regard to giving the governor um, full authority. One was in dealing with the health crisis. The other was in dealing with, with the budget. And when uh, he was given uh, full authority to deal with the health crisis at that time, um, the legislators thought that they were doing the best thing that they, they could. Um, we did not know a lot about the uh, pandemic. We did not know a lot about the virus at that time. And in order to make some quick decisions, uh, I guess that was the best course of action. Well, here we are now, many, many months later, we've got control in our area of uh, the virus. We know a lot more about it. And it's gone on a little too far. I feel like the legislature has abdicated their duties and it's time to go back to work. So I think now is the proper time to be rescinding the governor's powers. We can go back to the table and talk about what decisions need to be made from here that are going to be the best decisions for the state, certainly for the 50th district, and certainly when you're looking at the regional approach. You know, when we, don't forget, when, uh, when we shut down and then started the reopening process, we went to a regional approach, which was a great way to handle it, but uh, it, it's almost like it's been abandoned now. No one knows what phase we're in, and we have no plan to move forward for New York but with maintaining a, um, a, a, a pretty consistent infection rate. So uh, it is time, uh, in my mind, um, to get those powers back into the hands of the legislature, get them to do the job that we've elected them to do, and move forward. Thank you, Mr. Renner. Mr. Mannion, you'll have uh, two minutes on this subject. I'm proud to live in New York State, and I'm proud to have lived my entire life in central New York. Um, we've had very strong leadership at the state level and at the local level, and all of those leaders have applied science to their decision making. We needed swift, decisive action. 
to make sure that we kept this virus in check. And fortunately for us, we have A plus healthcare institutions and systems within our counties that make sure that we could get the people the health care they need. And beyond that, we could keep the virus in check using our tracing and our testing mechanisms. It has been a challenge and our leadership has been strong. Other places in this country are suffering and prolonging not just the impact of the pandemic, but the economic impact that's present. And therefore, I'm sure that we're going to continue to apply science to decision making. We're going to make sure we do everything we can to keep the infection rate low. What has changed recently and was what is causing an increase in infection rate is the fact that we're trying to provide an enriched education for children, both at the higher ed level and K through 12. And as a result, we are congregating people. And as a result of that, viruses will spread. We're trying to be safe as we can and still tr trying to provide necessary services for people. But this is a challenge. And therefore, I'm happy that we have the strong leadership locally and at the state level that we do. All right, thank you. Mr. Boyer, we have about- Can you specify, Mr. Mannion, I just wanted to make sure that, that I could get as part of that answer a yes or no on whether you're comfortable with the governor sure. continuing with the emergency powers. Yes, the, thank you. I appreciate the follow-up. The pandemic is not over. We are still in the midst of an emergency, and I do believe that the legislator is going to take back those pow powers um, when they believe that we're in a good spot. And, and just to kind of come back to you, Ms. Renna, on, um, uh, on your stance, do you have any, any reservations given the, the recent upticks? I mean, here in Cayuga County, we, we actually have more more active cases by far than we've ever had here in, in October. Um, would it be wise to wait another couple of months to get through this potential second wave? You, you know, Jeremy, and one of the reasons for the upticks is the visitation that has been turned back on at, at Auburn Correctional, so we could also talk about that. But, um, you know, I think that over the last seven, seven months, we've been given the opportunity to get the infrastructure in place that we needed from a, a testing and tracing standpoint and maintaining. I know we've got some blips in, in, uh, in the cases, but uh, we're still maintaining a very, very low infection rate. So no, I don't have any reservations about it because now we have the infrastructure and we know what we need to do to move the needle and we just need to continue to message out to the community how important it is to wear your mask and social distance and protect one another while you're out in, in uh, public and while you're congregating. Thank you. Mr. Boyer, we have less than 10 minutes left, so we're going to let, leave it up to you to do two one-minute questions. Uh, for And if there's a rebuttal, it'll be one minute as well, but uh, we want to wrap it up with two more questions. Mr. Boyer. Okay. Well, I, it's possible this may be only one question then, but um, I, I definitely want to make sure we get the cash bail um, because uh, that's been a, a big issue um, for the state legislature. Um, the new law that went in, into effect at the start of the year um, eliminated cash bail for most crimes and and after concerns were raised about some dangerous offenders getting released um, then uh, they amended the law and they, they put some additional charges into the bail eligible list um, so my question for both candidates is uh, you know given the changes that were made and where we're at now are you comfortable with where we are on the cash bail law um, and uh, sort of another facet of that um, What's your thoughts on the underlying um, reasoning for doing this in the first place and that some people are saying uh, cash bail was discriminating against poor people who um, you know, don't have the money necessarily to pay the bail, even though uh, maybe a wealthier person charged with the same crime would. All right, Mr. Banyan, we're going to give you a minute and a half on this one. Okay. Uh, and we'll yeah. do the same to you, uh, Ms. Renna, sure. and then we'll go from there. Mr. Mann. Well, I bl there's great consensus in my conversations with members of the district attorney's office, judges, law enforcement, uh, community advocates, and, and lawyers that, and, and police officers, that cash bail was flawed and it negatively impacted the poor communities. Um, the criminal justice system, and we're trying to make it better, treats rich, guilty people better than it does poor, innocent people. 
of somebody that's charged with a crime that they're innocent of and they can't pay bail, they're guilty because they can't get out of jail. There's great consensus that that's flawed. When the reform came and across basically every constituent group, there was agreement that we had to eliminate cash bail, like is the case in other states, that we didn't get it right. And when a reform occurred and legislation went through the majority conference, we had no senator at that time. We had no senator to bring the voices and the values of central New York to make sure that we get this legislation right. And we do still have work to do. We have to stay in close communication with members of law enforcement, district attorney, and social advocates to make sure that these communities are coming together and that our voices and our values of central New York are heard. I believe I can build that bridge because I have great relationships. I have family members in law enforcement. Many of my friends are in law enforcement, and I'm closely connected to the community that wants change. Serena, you'll have a, about a minute and a half as well. Sure. Well, and as, as Mr. Mannion knows, I have just about every endorsement from the law enforcement community. Uh, and, and, and solely because of this reason, I'm on the right side of it. No one is saying that we want someone who steals a loaf of bread to have to stay um, in jail uh, undo. But uh, certainly there were uh, issues with bail reform that still need to be fixed. And uh, the, the Democrats are just pushing against it. Listen, when you still have as cash, uh, as cash eliminated violent crimes like assault and stalking and menacing and crimes against children, then it is not, it's not the right bill and that's what, that's not the right law and that's what we need to fix. New York State is the only state that has taken away judges' discretion when it comes to determining whether this is a violent uh, repeat offender and, and should they uh, remain behind bars until uh, their day in court. And so, um, you know, we've, we've got to work on these issues. They're big issues. And then to have this unfunded mandate on uh, the backs of the uh, departments and the district attorney's office with regard to discovery, um, it's just ridiculous. And in addition to that, the discovery laws that created victims of these crimes and witnesses that are trying to do their part as community members, um, having their personal information released and then um, the possible uh, harm or intimidation that would come to them. This is just a bad law, and we need to work much, much harder to make it right. Okay, Mr. Manning, you're going to have 30 seconds, and we'll give Mr. Renner the same. I'll just simply say that the representative we had left, and as a result, uh, that legislation did not get a central New York, vo New York voice from the 50th Senate District trying to make sure that we got it right. Mr. Renner, I think that. Yeah. Here I am. I'm the voice. All right. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Mr. Boyer, for your thoughtful questions. We're going to now uh, turn and wrap up with our closing statements as we discussed at the beginning. We did a coin toss, and Mr. Mannion, who's on the uh, Democratic and Working Families Party, gets to go first with two-minute uh, statement, and then we'll finish up with uh, Angie Renna. Right. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I have great connections with Cayuga County and the city of Auburn. I've formed great relationships with many of your leaders both civic leaders and then also, you know, community leaders. So I've been a teacher for a long time. I haven't been corrupted by the political process, and I'm beholden to no one. I want to make sure that our voices and our values of Central New York, as I've lived here my whole life, are brought to Albany. We've lacked a state senator for over a year, and now we're walking into a budget crisis. We do not want somebody in the wrong room that has nothing to do with those decisions that may just cast a no vote on budgetary decisions. We want somebody in the room making sure that Central New York gets back their fair share. I feel very strongly about making sure that we re-establish respect in our elected officials, which I think we've lost over time. And that happens when we bring people from a variety of different backgrounds into the legislature especially people that come from a working class background like me. I promise to be a strong advocate for the district. I promise to bring my expertise in science and education. And I promise to make sure that every central New Yorker has quality, affordable health care. Thank you, Mr. Manning. We'll now hear from Angie Renner, who is on the Republican, Conservative, and Independence line. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here before you today, and thank you so much. 
So as you know, I am a mother of twin sons. I'm very proud of them. They've graduated college and they're here uh, earning a living and that's a tough thing to do in this day and age. As a small business owner, just trying to make sure that uh, we're doing our part with our clients to help them stay in New York State, which is a very unaffordable state for many people on a fixed income. These are the reasons why I'm running to be your next state senator. These are the reasons in my background with 25 years of financial management is why I've already got the plans in place to help us get through a pandemic and it makes me uniquely qualified to bring us through this and get us to recovery and then beyond and create economic opportunities for all of us so that we can stay in New York, a place that we love, central New York, and have a quality, affordable, uh, uh, way of life. And I will just say that I'm very proud of uh, the campaign that we've run. We're keeping it clean. We're doing our part and we're just doing the hard work. I have traveled all over the district, which includes Cayuga County, and I've met some wonderful people and I'm very happy um, to have those opportunities to, to bring uh, the uh, ideas and the plans forward to help this, uh, this unique district of New York. And we're going to do a great job for all of us here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for not only being here in the studio and, and helping with our students' classes and all that, but also thank you for putting yourselves out there. Not an easy task, especially in a COVID-19 world. Uh, we wish you well on the campaign trail and uh, whoever is the winner of, uh, and don't raise your hand right now, but uh, whoever's <laughs> the winner of this race, you're always welcome in the studio to give Albany updates. Senator DeFrancisco, who we've mentioned a number of times, was I think most likely our longest serving guest. He was here on a regular basis. Uh, we also want to thank Mr. Boyer for his thoughtful questions as usual. He'll be back here in, uh, on Tuesday with uh, our last forum. And we also want to thank you, uh, the listeners and, and people who are viewing this tonight. Uh, this is an important race. It is a seat that has been open for some time. And we appreciate your time to, do, to tune in. Uh, these, one of these two will be my, const uh, my representative as well. I live in their district. So I think this is an important race as well. And we urge you to go out, either vote early, do absentee ballots, or make sure you get to the polls on November 3rd. The Citizen has on their site, auburnpub.com, uh, these forums for tonight and, and the others that we're doing. Uh, they can also be seen live on the uh, YouTube uh, uh, system for media at Cayuga that the college runs. A couple of quick programming notes. On Tuesday, October 27th, will be the 126th Assembly Forum with Dia Carbajal, who's a Democrat, running against John Lamadis, uh, who's a Republican, uh, to fill the seat being vacated by the retirement of Assemblyman Gary D. Finch. Um, who uh, that will be our final forum uh, and speaking of Mr. Finch he'll be in the studio next week we hope on Thursday October 29th to talk about his career in public service and give an all of the update we also uh, hope to bring in Senator Seward who is also retiring as we mentioned at the top of the uh, forum and then in two weeks we will have Cuyahoga County Public Health Director Kathleen Cuddy who will give us a final update uh, for the semester on COVID-19 and the spike in Cuyahoga County so we hope you'll tune in for that until Tuesday for Key Community College and for The Citizen, I'm Guy Cosentino. We hope you've enjoyed this forum. We wish you a good night, a safe weekend, and we'll see you back in the studio on Tuesday.